um, to um, should use the current powers that it already has to deal with that failure. And I think that point has been made by many, many colleagues around the UK um, that the that, um, Food Standards Agency does have power out there, to, uh, has power already to deal with, with, with failing local authorities. And if if you like, issues of failure are at the heart of this, then we strongly believe that they should be using those powers. We also take the view, if you like, as, as a starter, that, um, that at the conclusion of the Regulating Our Future programme, the FSA must maintain its uh, position as central competent authority, as CCA. And particularly, we take the view, it must be seen to be and act as it says on your screen, as a strong regulator. Now, there's a whole bunch of issues about what we mean by it being a strong regulator. And one of those issues we, we highlighted in the, in, in the previous bullet point, if you like, on this slide, and that is that if individual local authorities are found to be failing in some way, then the Food Standards Agency should use its powers that it has to deal with that. We're also clear that the agency's primary role is to set standards and to set sta not only to set standards, but to make sure that there are strong and robust systems in place for delivering those standards. And we, won't, we don't want to see anything that, that, that emerges out of, out of ROF that, that it, um, affects that in any way. And finally, if you like, as our prerequisites, in, in respect of regulating our future. We support the development of a holistic approach to food safety standards and feed regulation. And by that, we mean very specifically, we know already that um, environmental health professionals are educated and trained to not only deal with, with food safety issues. We know that, for instance, in Northern Ireland, they also deal with food standards. And we take the view that that should be that that ability should be there across the whole of the United Kingdom and that we should have the additional ability to deal with feed regulation as well. So we take the view, as I say there, that, that, that um, we're strongly supportive of, of a holistic approach to all of this. Um, and if that means that additional training and development is required for environmental health professionals to, en to enable them to fully engage in, in regulation of, of food safety standards and feed, then so be it. Then we'll we'll be happy to work with the Food Standards Agency to make that um, uh, to make that a reality. So here we go. The first of our um, polls um, that you've got the opportunity now um, to vote on, and um, you've got voting buttons that should be in front of you. So the first question that is there is that: Do you agree that the Food Standards Agency should use its current powers? to address failing local authorities. Your opportunity to vote, um, go ahead and click the necessary button, please. And uh, as soon as we've got an answer to that, um, we'll, uh, we'll, um, I'll give you um, the outcome to that poll. As things are moving on, I'm just looking at the screen, my screen at the moment, and I can see that people are voting. I can see that the numbers are changing. And it's a very, very strong um, view, as I thought it would be that the FSA should be using its current powers to address failing local authorities. To give you the percentages that we're looking at there, we're looking at about 88% of you out there that are saying, yes, very, very firmly, FSA should be using its current powers. Nobody, absolutely nobody has said no. And somewhere in the order of 12% of you have said maybe. And I can see why some of you, I could come up with reasons why some of you might indeed say maybe, but there's a very, very clear view there. On that, uh, on that particular one. So um, moving on, uh, I should have said at the start, I've got um, a couple of people sat um, at the side of me and I ought to give them a quick name check. Uh, <laughs> they're shaking their heads and saying, no, they don't want to be known. Well, too late. Um, twiddling, the, uh, twiddling the knobs and the faders on the right of me, I've got Sam Cleal and also monitoring um, input from you uh, on the other side of the table. Um, we've got Owen sitting there um, and uh, we're all together trying to make this thing work. So moving on, anyway, um, dealing with um, issues around um, costs and businesses paying for regulation. 
which is uh, a very, very clear strand to regulating our future. Well, CIEH strongly supports um, the principle that businesses should meet the cost of regulation. However, that said, um, we take a very, very specific view that clarity is needed from the agency on the full scope of costs that the ROF program is going to bring to business, to, in, to the industry as a whole, and not just to business, to local authorities too. And what goes along with that is that we take the view that there should be a very, very clear picture of the anticipated savings to the public purse that ROF will generate. And that too is, from our perspective, is very, very important because um, we're looking at, we look at the, the ROF program, we can see the extent of the changes that are there. We can see that this is going to cost. And our, our view is that, that the benefits that accrue from this should at least outweigh the costs of implementation. And one of the key benefits is that, that we're looking for a system here that, that hopefully will be better and will be more cost effective. And we want to know specifically how the agency intends or intends to address the key, one of the key concerns of business, namely that it, as business says, it already pays for regulation or um, that's taking place and it pays for that regulation through business rates. So that one, I think we need to hear the narrative from the Food Standards Agency on how it's going to square that particular um, challenge away. And we also believe that the agency should be prepared to explore a range of other charging models um, that are evident uh, across the world. And the one that is cited there and the one that, that I have a little bit of knowledge about is the one that operates in California. And I've referred to it as the Californian compliance rebate model, um, basically where uh, businesses, food business in California, um, pay a fee to their local authorities for regulation. But depending on the extent at which they comply, they get money back. So if they're fully compliant, it's cost neutral to the business. And um, we take the view that that, that sort of uh, process, that sort of payment pro, uh, process should at least be considered as part of, the, uh, of regulating our future and the, uh, to, to meet the principle of business paying for regulation. Um, so what else have we got to say in, in relation to in relation to ROF? Well, one of the other key strands that is out there is that, that um, um, the, the the ROF program initially started to talk about permit to trade. In other words, businesses should be given a permit to operate, in effect, a license, if you like, to operate um, prior to them opening to their doors for the first time. Now, we particularly support that, um, that uh, idea. We've done so for years, particularly when we used to talk about the idea of, of, of the licensing of food businesses. And this is tantamount to licensing. So we particularly support permit to trade as a concept. But we do acknowledge, um, as the agency has acknowledged over, over recent months, uh, that introducing permit to trade um, is particularly difficult at this time. Um, as I understand it, it would require uh, primary legislative change, and that will be difficult getting the necessary parliamentary time with everything going on around Brexit at the moment. So we ac absolutely accept um, that you know achieving permit to trade is going to be difficult, and therefore then uh, what follows it is that, that we strongly support at the moment um, the intention to develop an um, enhanced registration system. As long as that the, any enhanced registration system um, doesn't impose additional burden on business, but also make sure that wherever possible, it joins up with other requirements for data to be provided by businesses um, to other government departments. And, and the classic example there would be to the likes of Companies House or to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs um, and, and, and things like that. And we also take the view um, that in respect of, of enhanced registration, um, we believe that in as far as the existing system is concerned, it's not so much that there are large numbers of unregistered food businesses, but the food business operators don't proactively register their business. Now, it's all very well then saying that, you know, we support an enhanced registration system. 
there has to be a means of ensuring that food business operators actually engage with that system. So there has to be an element of carrot and maybe stick that goes with that to formalize that process. Otherwise, we'll end up with nothing better than what we've currently got. And we also take the view as part and parcel of, of an enhanced registration system um, that consideration should be given by the Food Standards Agency to um, requiring a named responsible person to be identified and available for each registered and approved, if ultimately approved, food business. Now, that kind of system operates elsewhere in the world. Um, we came across it so a number of years ago when we did some, when I did some work in Hong Kong, where every single food business has a named responsible person. That named responsible person is known to the, to the local authority. Um, they have they ultimately shoulder the responsibility for the level of compliance and the day-to-day -day operation of um, delivering food safety within that business. And we take the view that it should, it is not, should not be beyond the, the realms of possibility to ensure that um, as part and parcel of an enhanced registration system um, in, in the UK under ROF that, that we can achieve that kind of outcome. Moving to the, the second of our questions, and again, another of your opportunities for you to engage with us. So uh, again, you've got your voting buttons, and I'd, I'd love to know whether you uh, welcome the Food Standards Agency's proposals so far as we currently know them in relation to uh, the enhanced registration of food businesses. So use the voting buttons, um, make the appropriate click, and we'll see how that pans out. Um, it's looking interesting at the moment. I can see you voting. I can see the numbers squaring away and um, not so clear cut, at least at the moment, as, as the first particular poll. Um, as things stand at the moment, we're, we're looking at about 70% of people saying yes, 28 or so, 27% of people saying maybe, and um, with two or three percent saying no, an interesting split. So it's a very tiny number saying no, if you don't welcome it. Well, if you don't welcome it, what would you want? Maybe you want to tell us and part and parcel of the comments and questions that you got the opportunity to put to us at the end. Um, if you're saying maybe, then um, what, um, why are you maybe at the moment? Is it just that there's a complete, there's a lack of detail there? Again, give us some feedback. Use the opportunity using the submission of questions to tell us some of these things. That'd be great if we could have that kind of feedback because at the end of the day, um, one of my jobs, um, one of my particular roles, if you like, in, is that I liaise with the Food Standards Agency, as I said right at the start, and I do so on the basis of not if you like, at trying to achieve what I want to achieve, but what collectively you want to achieve as members of CIH. So um, the more information I have from you about your views in relation to Roth, the better. And I can make sure that, that uh, uh, colleagues in the Food Standards Agency are aware of those positions. So yeah, the, the votes steadied out. Final figures, 69% said yes, 3% said no, and 28% said maybe. So thank you for voting on that one. Um, move along, Sam, if we can. So um, moving on to um, segmenting the uh, the marketplace, um, and we've got an element of segmentation. I accept that at the moment in relation to risk. Um, but again, one of the key strands of ROF is the idea of segmenting. Now, um, I'm not going to say too much on this. I don't think there's much I can say at the moment. In principle, and I stress in principle, we support the work on segmenting the market in accordance with risk, but we, we hold back at the moment. This is not an unequivocal um, uh, support. We're supporting in principle because at the moment we need more information. We need more information to develop a hard position on this. So I don't want to say too much more at the moment, but that's, uh, that's as much as I can say right now, Sam. Let's move on. And straight into another voting opportunity for you. They're coming thick and fast at the moment. So again, you've got your voting buttons. Let us know, please. Do you believe that those offering assurance to business should be able to issue food hygiene rating scores? Wow, now that's the contentious one. We're starting to get into some of the contentious issues. And I'll, a little bit more about assurance in a moment or two. But my guess is 
some of you have already heard about assurance heard about where the agency wants to go on on assurance and you've maybe got some views that you've already formed about this and so do you believe that uh, those offering assurance to business should be able to issue food hygiene rating scores um, I did some work um, on with media on this a few months ago I spoke to the LGA on this particular issue I fully recognize that, that, that we all have differing opinions on this and that there are concerns out there, but you're right now are giving me a very, very clear steer, a very, very clear steer. Certainly 85% of all the people that are logged onto this um, webinar right now are saying a very, very loud and clear no to those offering assurance being able to issue food hygiene rating scores. 85% saying no, 15% saying maybe, and absolutely none of you, none of you saying yes. Um, that's interesting. More about assurance, more about food hygiene ratings as part of assurance in a moment. So um, thank you very much for that. That very, very clear steer. Appreciate that one. Can we move on, Sam? Thank you. Um, I said there was going to be more about assurance, and I want to touch on it. Um, and there is, I want to support, talk specifically a moment about um, certified regulatory auditors and the proposals that are in the ROF to do with that. Um, assurance is the central plank of regulating our future. And it is, without question, the most contentious aspect of it. Um, we've had members of my team, I've also attended, we've also had or members out there, ordinary members out there, um, attending the uh, round robin um, seminars that the agency ran through the summer to discuss some of these aspects. And so we are well aware of what colleagues around the UK said directly to the agency on matters relating to um, assurance. And um, we know with, with certainty that it is highly contentious. However, it has to be said that the proposals from the agency in relation to assurance strongly reflect um, the Cabinet Office report on regulatory futures. The government is quite clear about the direction. And so this is not just, if you like, the Food Standards Agency going off on one. There is a very, very clear direction that is set here from government which the agency is in turn picking up on in relation to, to assurance. Now, I'll nail our colors to the mast as an organization. And from you know, having had a myriad of, colleague, uh, of, com, uh, of discussions with colleagues around the country, I think where we've got to is that CIEH supports assurance in principle. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. We acknowledge um, that business already buys in support through consultants um, uh, who are in effect providing the business with assurance about its levels of compliance. Businesses do that for a whole host of reasons, some maybe to do with insurance. In other words, their insurance requires that kind of, of, of direct feedback. Others do it for reasons of brand protection, but suffice it to say, a significant number of businesses out there already buy in that assurance. And that assurance is in the main coming from environmental health colleagues. They are members of CIEH. They're qualified to do exactly the same things as, as those of, of colleagues who are out there in local authority. Um, but they operate, obviously, um, from, the, from a consultancy base. So they're out there delivering that assurance already. We support the, the principle of assurance on the basis that businesses are already buying it. And, and this is the specific point, we acknowledge that those conducting assurance hold large amounts of additional data concerning businesses and their levels of compliance, and that that data could be made available to inform wider decision making by local authorities. I know that in relation to many of the businesses 
that you regulate, if you're working for local authorities, you maybe get out and see them once every what, 18 months. In some instances, less frequently than that. On the other hand, the assurers working with consultancies may be in two or three times a year. It's, it would seem to me to make sense, therefore, that data that is gathered through an assurance process should be made available more widely. And that's, if you like, the principle that we support here. We accept assurance is already taking place. We accept that people going in to deliver assurance are, if, are environmental health professionals. And we accept that the data, that there is a, a large amount of data that emerges from that process that could be extremely helpful to support um, the work of local the decision the work of local authorities and the decision making of local authorities. So, what else can I say about assurance? Well, when we speak to when I speak to the, the consultancies themselves, um, t um, we had a meeting here um, back in August where many of the uh, consultancies were present and uh, to discuss this issue of assurance and regulating our future. When we spoke to them directly, um, they said to us very, very strongly that they believed that, that they are also delivering a public health function. They, re they take the view that what they are doing is complementary to what local colleagues in local authorities are doing. And that ultimately, you all have the same goal, and that is that you're delivering food that is safe and what it says it is, and that in doing so, you're protecting the health of the public. Now, consultancies also told us um, at that meeting back in August and at several other meetings that I've had with, with, with them that they see no value in assurance being part of regulating our future unless they can, can, de can determine and set a food hygiene rating score as part of their assurance contract. Now, I guess because of the poll that just took place a minute or two ago, you take a very different view to that, or at least those of you who are logged on do. 85% um, of you said um, no to that one, and the balance 15% of you uh, said maybe and not one of you supported it. Um, but they take the view that no part that assurance has no part of ROF unless they can determine and set food hygiene rating. Um, however, we recognize that um, that is inconsistent with current legislative requirements, particularly in Northern Ireland and Wales, where if you where you like um, food hygiene rating is mandatory um, and it's mandatory upon local authorities. We also know that British Hospitality Association is currently developing an assurance system for the catering sector. We had some discussions with BHA uh, as part and parcel of, of that development process. We had some discussions with the Food Standards Agency, but I want to make it clear that the that the, de the developments there are British Hospitality Association uh, developments. CIEH may have uh, an involvement in that because ultimately if, and I stress if, the agency um, accepts the proposals from the uh, uh, British Hospitality Association, then there will be issues around competence of those people undertaking the assurance activities. And that is where CIEH has a role in as much as we set the parameters, if you like, for training the next generation, educating and training the next generation of food safety professionals. We assess that, we assess them, we certificate them, and we register their credentials through the Environmental Health Registration Board. So there is a potential for us to be involved there, but we want to make it clear that those proposals that are being developed are British hospitality associations. And we've also provided a commitment to the Food Standards Agency to develop our own simple assurance model, um, which will be potentially be suitable across all food industry sectors. And we've started to engage with the agency around some of the proposals 
um, uh, around that. Now, I, I can't say too much more about that at the moment. Suffice it to say, those proposals that we're starting to discuss with the agency about a simple assurance model take account of the, if you like, the prerequisites that I mentioned at the start of this presentation. And those prerequisites were that we maintain the position of local authorities. As competent authorities, we maintain the position of the FSA as central competent authority, etc., etc. So we're not going to, what we're, we're talking to the agency is not about undermining those prerequisites, those principles that we set out right at the start of this presentation. Um, we've already said that, 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 that the issue of, of um, assurers issuing food hygiene rating is contentious, and it's already clear from what we're seeing from ROF and from the discussions around the country that much revolves around the uh, perceived value of the food hygiene rating system to both industry and to consumers. And indeed, the agency published a report only yesterday on that particular issue. If you haven't seen it, go to the FSA website, have a look at it. Um, it is the idea of food hygiene rating is particularly valuable and we support the principle of it. We believe, um, CIH believes it empowers consumers to make choices uh, about where they eat and where they buy their food and we are equally conscious that some local authorities, and I stress now in England, don't have sufficient capacity to sustain a statutory food hygiene rating uh, scheme. We know that that is the position, however, colleagues already tell us in Wales and Northern Ireland is different. We believe that the um, FSA should fully scope what a mandatory system in England might look like. And we believe that they should then work with local authorities, CIH and possibly LGA as well, to better understand and quantify any resource shortfall and explore options for addressing it. And a resource shortfall comes not only in cash terms, but in, in human terms as well. The agency tell us, the LAMES data tells us already that there are issues of, of staffing levels of local authorities uh, in, in England, and that the, the, if you like, the staffing levels in food in England are half those in Wales or Northern Ireland. If you're gonna make food hygiene, uh, food hygiene rating mandatory, uh, for the whole of the UK, then those issues of resources need to be addressed. Um, and we equally take the view that the delivery of food hygiene rating by assurers in the private sector is only one option and that others should be considered as part and parcel of um, mandating uh, food hygiene rating for the entirety of the UK. So, quick question then for you. Should food hygiene rating be mandatory in England? And I stress this relates purely to England, please. So use your voting buttons. Let's see what you have to say on this one. Should food hygiene rating be mandatory in England? And right now, <laughs> the answers are very, very clear again, as you might expect. Looking at the way the poll is going at the moment, a massive, massive vote. Um, in, in, in relation to in relation to yes, something like 97% of you are saying very, very clearly, yes, should be mandatory in England. Only 3% of you saying maybe, and absolutely none of you saying no. So thank you for that response. That's, again, very, very useful. Um, I mentioned at the start that we're supportive of this idea of a holistic approach to food safety. Rough documentation implies that in future, all inspections will cover food safety standards and where appropriate feed, and that um, we take the view that we support this and we support the development of the holistic food officer and feel that this is long overdue. And I would remind you of what I said earlier, namely um, that if that means that we need to provide additional support and training for you out there, then that's something that we will work together with FSA uh, to make sure is achieved. So um, I want to mention something quickly about the devolved administrations, um, because I think this is absolutely important. In some respects, it ties in with all the hoo-ha that took place yesterday about Brexit, and you start to get an idea of some of the tensions here. Um, we know that devolution um, of key powers from Westminster to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland um, presents some challenges for off. We know that already because food safety is a, is a matter that is devolved 
to all of the respective administrations. Consequently, neither the Westminster government nor the FSA can unilaterally make decisions um, in respect of food safety systems and processes for the entirety of the UK. Um, and we recognise already that um, government in Wales and government in Northern Ireland are, are, are already making their views on some of these issues quite clear. One final, I think this is the final poll. Yeah, it is. Um, before I go on to talk a little bit more about um, um, the devolved the situation regarding devolution and regulating our future, I just would like to know, do you support the FSA's belief that having access to current, current assurance data will be a, valent, a valued asset to both the agency and to local authorities? Click your buttons on that and then I'll go on and wrap this this um, webinar, at least the presentation part of this webinar up um, to talk a little bit more about um, devolution and the impact on ROF. So um, I can see that you're, you're voting there and wow, that's, that is interesting. So in relation to do you support the FSA's belief that having access to current assurance data will be a valued asset, um, we've got 60, 60, almost 60% 60 of you saying yes. 3% um, of you saying no, so you don't, small number of you don't feel that having access to assurance data will be of any value, and the balance of you getting on for 40% of you saying maybe. So thank you for that. The interesting one is the no there. Um, perhaps you'd like to tell me why, and you've got the opportunity of using the, the questions, posing questions to do that. Um, moving on to bring this to a conclusion then. I have to say in respect of devolution that in respect of Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement of April 1998 um, poses some particular challenges. You saw this yesterday in all the hoo-ha relating to, to Brexit and the views of the Democratic Unionists and so on and so forth. And you saw the views being coming forward from the Irish Taoiseach yesterday from the Republic. So in respect of Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement is the foundation of the current peace process. It sets out a complex series of provisions and establishes cooperative institutions. But in addition, the agreement means that the Republic of Ireland has a say in matters um, relating to Northern Ireland that have an impact in the Republic. Now, what that basically means is, as we have worked it through, the Republic of Ireland has a say in matters relating to ROF because in turn they have an impact in the north of Ireland and its dealings with the Republic um, in relation to food. It gets messy, but I think we take that, we're taking that, that very, very clear view at the moment that this is a challenge that the FSA is going to have to face. And certainly talking to colleagues in the Republic um, that they too have some concerns that the Food Standards Agency will have to at some point engage very firmly with colleagues in the Republic to square this one away. We also know that in Wales, ministers have stated their preference for continued independent, consistent local authority food safety inspections. And we know that there is a Welsh working group that's been established to provide ministers with assurance that the needs of Wales are taking account within the ROF programme. So this whole issue of devolution is has got some way to run yet, um, and um, there are some particular challenges there that not only um, the Food Standards Agency um, is going to have to face up to for Wales and Northern Ireland, but it's also clear that the, the Republic of Ireland, I think, also has a role to play in some of this. And that, colleagues, brings us an end to, to to what I wanted to say about where we, CIH, currently stands in relation to ROF. Um, there is a meeting of the Food Standards Agency Board on um, Thursday, and uh, there is a significant report on regulating our future that is going to that board uh, on th a Thursday. That report is already in the public domain, uh, you can get hold of it through the FSA's website, and I would strongly recommend that you download a copy and read it, um, because I think it sets it certainly sets out where the agency currently sees things, it sets out where the current challenges are, and it's very clearly asking 
the FSA board for direction um, in in relation to um, uh, uh, the, the the way ROF is to roll out. So if you haven't had a chance to have a look at that report, please do so. Let's have a quick look at some of the questions that you've got. But um, before I do that, I just want to mention one additional thing. And that is on Thursday, um, we've also got our year ahead conference here at CIH. Um, the theme of the conference is regulation in a changing world. And it is um, an opportunity, there is an opportunity for uh, still for people to come along uh, and, and play a part in that if you haven't already booked your place. Uh, Michael Jackson from the Food Standards Agency from the ROF team will be here. ROF does figure on that program so if you want to know more come and get it from the horse's mouth. Come and talk to Michael. Come and talk directly to Michael. So please as I say if you've not um, yet booked a place and you still places are still available on that. Let's have a look at then, uh, some of the questions that you've posed. So let's see what we've got. Pick up at one or two. Let's have a look. Question from Paul Turner. We had to remove officers from food safety duties that didn't meet FSA code of practice competency requirements. Will the same requirements be applied to CRAs? Good, qu good question. Um, this whole issue of competence is one that's just about starting to open up. Um, CIH has asked the agency for a meeting to discuss uh, issues of competence and um, that um, those discussions are now starting to kick off. We expect a meeting to take place before Christmas between ourselves and the agency to begin discussing issues of competence. Um, but to, be, to answer Paul directly, I can't answer that right now, but I would expect that there should be no difference, frankly. Um, between the requirements in, in competence for people in local authorities or in do, those operating in, in, in uh, respect of assurance. You are either competent to do the task or you're not. And I take a very, very firm view on that one. Um, that is a personal view, but as I say, it will be subject to discussions with the agency. Um, but more about that in due course. Um, that's as much as I can do for you right now at the moment, Paul. What else have we got? Let's have a look at who else. Um, when the FSA are looking at, this is also from another question from Paul that came in quite early. When the FSA are looking at online registration, I'd like them to perhaps consider small takeaways and restaurants and international shops and what they are capable of doing. Thanks for that. I'll make sure that that's feedback, fed back to the agency. Um, let's have a look. What else have we got here? Um, I've got a question that um, I can't see the name of it at the moment from the person, but the question says, is this the beginning of the end for the public sector's role in food safety? Um, that's an interesting question. That's contentious, but you've heard what I've had to say on this as far as CIH is concerned. The answer to that should be a very definite no. Is it the thin end of the wedge? Um, I don't think so. And all the discussions I've had with the agency over the last 18 months, they've made it very clear. This is not a matter of, of if you like, starting a process of privatization. This is about getting the best possible um, system for regulating food safety that we can in the UK. And that that system involves a mix of, of uh, provision relating to local authorities and um, using the assurers to provide us with some additional data. CIH takes a very, very clear view. I said that right at the start. We take the view that nothing should be undone that undermines the position of local authorities as, as competent authorities here. Um, Next question from Linda. Hi, Linda. If assurance visits are going on in two or three, two, in two or three times a year, why are we finding businesses receiving <laughs> receiving them so poor? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, Linda then says this gives a clear indication something's not working. We find large businesses with consultants already in place that are dirty, poor record keeping, etc. Um, why does nobody take this on board? Um, I have to say to you, and you, I don't doubt what you say at all. You're at the sharp end. You're dealing with stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I hear exactly the same 
from those engaged in assurance about local authorities. And I think, as ever, the truth is probably um, that there are always going to be some uh, poor examples of assurance, as there are always some poor examples of uh, regulation from local authorities. Um, all the information that I have seen from all sides is that the vast majority of local authorities and indeed the vast majority of consultancies engaged in assurance activities do a good job. Um, but I do absolutely accept what you say there, Linda. Um, data would be fed back to um, directly to local authorities, whether it be fed back to primary authority only, um, whether it would be fed back to primary authority, local authority and FSA. Um, I think there are still some discussions to be had about that one. And, and certainly over the last few weeks, I have been outside of, of the, the way that that particular um, um, scheme has been developing. Um, but that was one possible solution to, to assurance uh, that, that rather than um, data or rather than food hygiene ratings being delivered directly by assurers, then information to support a rating would be fed back to primary authorities and possibly local authorities. I'm not going to get, I can't give you a definitive answer there, I'm afraid, Emma, um, but that's where, that's some, a flavour of some of the discussions that were taking place a few weeks ago in respect of that one. Um, question then that's come up can we ask the fsa why they are not using their powers in england to ensure that important services are properly resourced um and i think that's i'm not sure who that's come from it's anonymous at the moment or at least i can't see who it's come from um and i think well that's re refers to something i mentioned right at the start and maybe the person that posted this question wasn't there at the start and we do take a very very specific view as i said that the agency should be using its existing powers to deal with those local authorities that, 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 are, that are failing. And as I say, it was clear from the LAMES data that came out only a few weeks ago that the resources that are in place in England are, are somewhere of the order of 50% 50, uh, 50 less than those in Wales and uh, Northern Ireland. And yeah, CIH most definitely takes the view um, that the agency should be dealing with that, where they see that those very low levels of resources are make, uh, delivering, if you like, an unacceptable service um, under the current arrangements. Um, that's what else have we got here? Let's have a look at some of the other questions. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Question from uh, Nick Kelly. On behalf of is it is it envisaged that an enhanced registration scheme may be used as a sanction for non-compliance um in other words withdrawal of registration oh i see what you mean there nick um in other words non-compliance leads to withdrawal of registration that's a good question it's not one that i can answer at the moment maybe michael jackson can give us some information on that and maybe maybe I'll put that question to him at the uh, year ahead conference uh, next week or maybe 
Um, Nick, if you or one of your colleagues are coming along to that, you can put the question directly to Michael. I can see what you're meaning. In other words, you're seeing it as I indic as I implied that enhanced registration was, if you like, tantamount to or a way along the line of having a licensing system. In a licensing system, um, should there be one that um, breaches of license conditions lead to removal of a license? In effect, that's what you're saying, I guess. Um, sanction for non-compliance. If you're finding levels of non-compliance, does the registration end up being withdrawn? I don't know. Good question. Um, but I'll ask Michael and the Roth team uh, at some point. Um, I'm conscious that we've overshot the um, the uh, time for delivery of this. Um, but if there's one qu other quick question that I can take from anybody, I will do so. I've got loads of questions here, actually. Um, ta -ta. And it may well be that the best way to deal with this is to, for us to take the questions um, offline and to give answers to them and to publish those answers through the CIEH website. Um, I can also tell you that a recording of this particular webinar will also be available through um, the website at some point. What, next week, Sam? Probably next week. Let's have a look. Let's just have a look about any quick questions that I can do. No, they're quite lengthy ones. Oh yeah, here's one. Paul Turner, I'm concerned with uh, British Hospitality Association's plans to hold information privately, which protects intervention letters, photos, etc., from FOI requests. Um, if not subject to FOI, can we even produce food hygiene rating from that data? Um, good point. The whole one of the whole points, the whole, if you like, raison d'être for BHA operating a scheme was that. The idea being that businesses would have a freedom to provide data, to provide data that, we, that could then be transported to the agency, to local authorities, to primary authorities, um, without a fear of it being exposed through freedom of information. That was one of the principles, but you could equally see as Paul's doing there, looking at it from another perspective. It becomes hidden and it becomes private. Um, Certainly, that all the discussions I had with BHA was not about it being just private to BHA. It was a matter of sharing data amongst all those, all the agencies involved, local authorities, primary authorities, FSA, if that's necessary, but to do it in a way that wasn't then subject to FOI. Um, I can't comment further on that, as I say, because I've been slightly out of the loop with the BHA, the development of the BHA proposals of late. Um, at that point, it's five to 12. We've overrun by about 10 minutes. Um, I would like to thank all of you for the questions. There's an awful lot of them. I will draft responses to all of them and we'll post those responses, anonymizing where necessary um, on, on the website. So thank you to all for playing a part. Um, thank you all for um, your questions. Thank you for voting. And particular thanks to Sam and to Owen in the room for dealing with the technicalities of this. And um, enjoy the rest of your day. Um, <clears throat> and please stay in touch with us about this. Feel free to drop me an email. My email address is t.lewis at ciech.org. It's there, there's my telephone number. If you wanna make a specific point, if you wanna pose a specific question outside of this arena, the information's there, feel free to do so. So great seeing you all. Um, great seeing you all online. Thank you very much once again and bye-bye for now.